Hi there, my name is Maciej Talaga and for those of you who don't know me, I'm an archaeologist, but I prefer to call myself an archaeologist of motion. And by this I mean that I'm not so much, well, not mostly interested in the material objects that people used in the past, but rather in their motions, that is, how they use their whole bodies to do the things they had to do or desired to do. And another quirk of my approach is that I use my own body as a tool or a key to unlock certain information about the past. Uh, and today I would like to invite you to talk about walking and to be more specific about how they used to walk in the Middle Ages. Come along, it's gonna be fun. Walking is among the first things we learn as humans and seems as natural as it gets. But do we really know how our strolling compares to that of our ancestors? One way to find out is to step into their shoes. In its fundamental physical structure, the human body hasn't changed much over the past millennium. Just like us, our medieval ancestors had to eat, sleep or breathe air. Most of them had hard times digesting unprocessed milk. They used their legs to walk and hands to work, had the center of gravity near their hips, etc. These similarities, however, shouldn't blind us to the very real fact that the same structure, especially as rich in possibilities as our bodies, can be configured and used in many different ways. Ben Spatz, a British theatre scholar and philosopher, thought of human tinkering with the body as a kind of embodied research and coined the concept of branches and pathways in embodied knowledge. In a nutshell, it is to mean that each human body offers a multitude of paths in which its physical and kinesthetic qualities can be developed, but at one point or another these paths diverge becoming mutually exclusive. Think sprinters and marathon runners. Both groups are composed of very athletic sports people who specialize in running, but the physique of the former is nothing like that of the latter. Successful sprinters tend to be bulky, packed with muscle and very explosive, whereas marathon runners are lean, sinewy and tireless. The very different objectives and routines these two groups follow shape not only their running technique, but also their bodies. The said bodily transformation goes down to the very basic level. Sprinter's muscles have a significantly greater share of fast twitch fibers than we see in distance runners. If we remember the above caveat, then it becomes clear that even though we enjoy more or less the same physical frame as our medieval predecessors, chances are high that we use it in markedly different ways. There are few more basic human activities than walking. After all, since time immemorial, it is the ability to constantly move around on two limbs in an upright posture that has been humanity's main quirk, differentiating us from other animals. But can we really be sure that our walking gait is the same as that of people in the past? What about the shape of our feet? Here, I will address these questions by referencing some evidence related to one of the most iconic periods in European history, the Middle Ages. Before I cut to the chase, it seems necessary to explain my interest in medieval feet and locomotion. I am both a historian and a fencer, which led me to researching and practicing the so-called historical fencing or historical European martial arts, also known as HEMA. There, a particular late 14th century manuscript captured my imagination and my kinesthesia. Written by an anonymous scribe and known usually under its shelf number HS 3227A, this little book contains a sophisticated martial three ties on swordsmanship, horsemanship and wrestling. 
Even more interestingly, though, its author does not claim these fighting teachings as their own, but rather ascribes them to some other authority, the mysterious Master Lichtenauer. Captivated by this combat law, I spent the last 15 years trying to learn it through practice, sword and book in hand. For most of this time, I trained and explored the medieval sword handling techniques in a modern gym and wearing contemporary, highly engineered shoes. In time, however, it dawned on me that perhaps such modernized approach robbed me of an important piece of the puzzle. I understood that any form of hand-to-hand -hand combat starts with defeat. The kind of support you can reliably get from the ground while moving in relation to the opponent partly defines the kind of weapon action that you need to master. To illustrate, imagine you move in very thickly padded and sticky shoes on surfaces with good traction, such as modern gym floor. There, you can afford long strides and dynamic changes of direction, which means that you may often rely on sudden retreats as your primary form of defense. On the other hand, with more slippery shoes, your safety would have to be based more on parrying with the weapon. So, getting back from this necessary detour, my fancy practice informed by the teachings of Master Lichtenauer made me realize that I actually know very little about their extremely basic component of medieval physical culture, the footwork. Of course, defining medieval walking gait is a daunting task on many levels, not least importantly because of the sheer length of this period. The Middle Ages lasted roughly 1,000 years, with some historians arguing that many aspects of medieval culture lingered well into what we now call the modern period. On top of that, the Middle Ages were also far from a time of cultural stagnation. Quite the contrary, several parts of the medieval timeline were periods of serious historical acceleration, bringing major restructuring of European political, cultural, economic, religious and sometimes even ecological situation. Let us remember the Black Death in the 14th century and the rapid social-cultural transformations that followed. In this context, it comes as no surprise that some scholars believe that walking also underwent important changes during the long Middle Ages. Markita Falken, an archaeologist and a renowned expert on medieval footwear, sees the transition between the medieval and early modern period as the turning point in European walking. Prior to the advent of the 16th century, pavements and streets reinforced with cobblestones were either unknown or very rare. It meant that early medieval and high medieval feet of walkers or runners would encounter relatively soft surfaces, such as mud, dirt, flexible wooden planks, grass or sand. This, Falcon argues, was a favorable environment for using the so-called forefoot gait, that is, a manner of walking in which the front part of the foot is first to land on the ground. In simple words, it is a step landing on the toes or ball of the foot rather than on the heel. Nowadays, it is well established by human performance scientists that the forefoot gait is actually beneficial, as it puts less strain on the knee joints and helps develop proprioceptive motor control in the legs. This perk makes it a fundamental skill for barefoot runners and an increasingly popular technique among running athletes of all sorts. Falcon puts more weight on her argument by pointing out that before the 1500s, medieval European shoe soles had no heels. They were just thin pieces of hardened leather or even textiles or plant fibers. The junction of the soft surface and the thin sole of a shoe is where the medieval forefoot gait emerged. And it ruled until the early modern period brought proliferation of artificial hardened surfaces and shoe types with reinforced heels. Together, these two innovations allowed for breaking with the millennia old kinesthetic tradition and adopting what we nowadays see as the natural way of walking, the heel strike. However, the logical and seemingly convincing picture painted by Vulcan has some intriguing gaps. First of all, she seems to overlook the fact that many pre-modern European shoes did have reinforced soles, especially starting from the 14th century. 
In many archaeological shoes from the late medieval period, soles have additional layers of leather sewn on the heel and or the forefoot, strongly suggesting that both ends of the foot needed cushioning against the impact of the stride. Similarly, when pilgrims had nails put in their shoe soles for better traction, they were distributed evenly on the whole thing, again implying that the heel was used to hit the ground as well. Moreover, when you come to think about it, preferably during a walk, it is somewhat illogical to argue that softer surfaces prompted people to use the forefoot instead of the heel strike. The latter gait, understood as a stride in which the heel is first to land on the ground, is known as biomechanically more efficient in propelling a person forward. It allows for longer steps and facilitates moving the center of mass from the rear to the front. Obviously, as I mentioned before, heel strike puts greater stress on the knee joints, but this problem becomes important mostly on harder surfaces, which were uncommon in the Middle Ages. The softer surfaces are much more forgiving and should allow for using the heel strike safely on most occasions. In fact, ethnographic research on extant traditional societies where barefoot locomotion is still the norm indicate that both forefoot gait and heel strike are used. Similarly, even medieval depictions of very dynamic and competitive motion show both forefoot and heel first footwork. A powerful example is the fight book by a famous medieval German fencing master, Hans Tachhofer, showing wrestlers and fencers. All this evidence calls Vulcan's generalization into question. It has to be, nevertheless, admitted that there is one vehement physical activity which is never shown with anything resembling the heel strike gait running. At least since the late Middle Ages, when historical source base became richer, European townspeople and noble youth enjoyed foot races a lot. They would take place nearly everywhere, from town streets providing relatively hard footing to mountain meadows covered in soft grass. Whatever the run running surface, the runners are always depicted on the tip of their toes in postures far removed from those typically associated with the activity of running nowadays. Interestingly, the same runners are also hardly ever shown in leather shoes. Instead, they tend to wear thin textile shoes, sometimes even hosiery without additional footwear, or run completely barefooted. Perhaps this choice should be understood as a way to enhance performance by increasing traction. Leather soles grip the ground less firmly than thinner and softer soles, not to mention the bare skin of the foot. Whatever the reason, it doesn't seem far-fetched to say that late medieval athletes preferred more or less barefoot running. The examples quoted above, pilgrims with shoes nailed on the heel, walkers from traditional societies using forefoot gait as well as heel strike, German wrestlers doing the same, and late medieval barefoot runners demonstrate once more that the Middle Ages tend to escape easy generalizations. The available evidence indicates that there was no such thing as a dominant gait in this period. Rather, all parts of the uh, forefoot to heel strike continuum can be identified in iconography and archaeological material. It is interesting, at least from where I stand, that all the arguments undermining Vulcan's seemingly logical forefoot gate hypothesis were not found in any published scholarly work. I collected them myself and would have never done that if not for one peculiar reason. I started wearing historically accurate replicas of late medieval shoes daily during the majority of my physical activities. I worked in the garden in them, took my kids to playgrounds in them, ran in the forest in them, and even trained and fought in them during fencing lessons or outdoor weightlifting sessions. And so it continued for a full 12 months, and remains an important part of my weekly regimen even today, more than a year later. It is this sustained practice that opened me to the observations listed above and inspired me to seek or revisit historical and archaeological sources shedding light on medieval walking and running gates. In short, to borrow from Ben Spatz again, I was engaged in a kind of embodied research. 
The actions and sensations of my modern body reveal certain knowledge about the past physical culture. This knowledge was not produced but revealed, discovered. It was already there, as I didn't find any previously un unknown sources. I simply looked at those available before a bit differently than other historians, because of the physical embodied experience that sedimented in my body as well as my shoes. It was the wear on the heels and front parts of my shoes after a few months of daily use that prompted me to check whether such damage pattern is compatible with archaeological soles from the period. And it was. The rest of the findings that followed were already discussed above. So, what I wanted to highlight here is that my polemics with Markita Vulcan is a result of an unorthodox, hands-on and, well, feet-on method of doing history. Let us call it embodied historical research. The capacity of my embodied research to broaden the perspective on historical sources is probably its key value from a historian's perspective. But on the personal level it goes well beyond that. I have already mentioned that the repeated practice of walking and running left use wear marks on my replica shoes, and the same is true about marks on my body and motion. I used to suffer from an old injury. Back in 2009, uh, I tore ligaments in my left ankle, which would randomly cause acute pain several times a day. It was a major obstacle in my work as a fencer and coach. In effect of this injury, I was persuaded by doctors to forget about any dynamic sports. And although giving up fencing was out of questions for me, I decided to stop running. But then, a decade later, came my PhD research on late medieval physical culture and I had to give running another try, only this time in period footwear. At first, I tried to run using my previous technique, developed while wearing well cushioned shoes with ankle support, but it didn't work well. The thin medieval soles offered little protection from nasty little stones, pointy branches and other nuisance of country trails and forest floor. In effect, my heels and midsections of the feet would be very miserable, even after a relatively short run. Moreover, the injured ankle would also hurt. However, I carried on with the running and let the body find some comfort in it. This gradually led me to a slightly different technique, where I strictly avoided hitting the ground with the heel landing on the midfoot or forefoot part instead. The change was rather subtle, but its impact was huge. Already after three months of this practice, the ankle pain disappeared and hasn't returned ever since. Also, the skin on my feet grew thicker, gradually allowing me to increase the running pace without the need for thicker cushioning of the soles. The strangled muscles elevating the heel, in turn, influenced my ability to dynamically move around in replica shoes while fighting. I also noticed that I had subconsciously altered my lunging technique to allow for explosive fencing attacks without the risk of slipping on uneven natural surfaces. So, I can say that embodied historical research transformed me on three levels. First was the very tangible restructuring of my body empowering and beneficial for most parts, although my wife doesn't really appreciate the look of my thicker and callous feet, to be honest. But, well, in parallel with it, came the wear of the material artifacts participating in my practice, that is, the shoes. These visible and clear changes in the matter were associated with more subtle changes in the way I moved, forming a circular feedback loop. As my shoes wore, my body hardened, allowing me to explore the motions of walking and running deeper and deeper, thus leading to even more wear and hardening. Now, uh, just a few weeks before preparing this video, I decided to progress from running in thin-soled shoes to going literally barefoot. And it works. As unthinkable as it was for me back in 2020, I am now able to run a few miles through a forest 
without any kind of footwear and remain unskated. And it's autumn already. The thicker skin on the underside of my feet and the increased awareness of the traveled surface protect me from harm well enough. This leads me to the third and last effect of embodied historical research, that is, its epistemic and cognitive value. On the personal level, it clearly sharpened my perception of the environment while walking or running. Thick soled shoes forgive careless treading much more than medieval ones or bare feet. Without them, bodily sensations, unpleasant, quickly teach a person how to place the foot to avoid pain or wounds. A cognitive change without a doubt. From a historian's perspective, in turn, embodied research not only offers a different view on the sources, but also shows a thing or two about the past. Obviously, I can't claim I got medieval feet by walking in, ep uh, in replica shoes for a year. However, the fact that my feet, body and mind had to change in order to assimilate this archaic practice does not only demonstrate the trivial fact that medieval bodies differed from ours, but also hints at how they differed. In conclusion, the embodied approach to history may open us to certain aspects of the past that are otherwise hidden. For one, it has certainly revealed quite a lot about very basic human activities, walking and running. In the light of the available evidence, it doesn't seem justified to think that the Middle Ages saw any kind of universally adopted walking gait. Nevertheless, dynamic physical actions such as fighting or quick running were challenging in leather-soled shoes which didn't grip the ground too well. Medieval practitioners would adapt to this challenge by adjusting both their gait and shoes for particular situations. In the most dynamic activities, such as running, they would often use more of a midfoot or forefoot gait and select their footwear deliberately to gain better traction. The latter could be achieved either by using thinner and more flexible soles or by going all natural and taking off shoes altogether. These solutions, the gait and minimalist footwear, meant that their feet and legs had to withstand pressures similar to those experienced by modern barefoot runners. They required well-developed muscles stabilizing the ankle, high flexibility of, flexibility of the underside of the foot, as well as thick skin.